Hello, everyone. It's uh, Larry Kotlikoff back with Economics Matters, the podcast. Today, I'm delighted, just delighted to have my, I guess, professional life, not quite lifetime, but almost lifetime, close friend, Michael Boskin. We've been, uh, I would say, good buddies for, well, I don't know. The major part of a century. <laughs> a good, <laughs> the better part of a century, yeah. The uh, And... You know, I've known a lot of economists. I, I I've had the great uh, kind of pleasure, honor to interact with some of the big stars in economics over the years, uh, from Ken Arrow to Milton Friedman to uh, uh, Franco Modigliani, big names. People won Nobel prizes. Bob Merton, uh, Peter Diamond, but. Uh, Michael hasn't yet won his Nobel Prize, but I got to say that of all the people I've talked to um, about economics, uh, I would say I've learned as much as uh, from Michael as from anybody in any kind of just a, a conversation about anything. Uh, Michael just is the consummate economist who uh, knows economics inside and out, but also has enormous intuition and also data at his fingertips that you wouldn't know about and then enormous policy experience in the real real world which um, most people don't realize that there's some economists out there who've actually made things happen made a, a big difference uh let me just give you michael's uh, brief bio it's not that it's, i'm gonna make it as brief as as is reasonable but he's the totally M. Friedman, Professor of Economics and Senior Fellow at Hoover, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. So he's a Professor of Economics at Stanford and Fellow at the Hoover Institution. He's a Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. That's the clubhouse for economists in that's headquartered in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, that uh, basically most top economists are connected to. Uh, he served as a president, uh, as a chairman of the uh, President's Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, the nickname is C CEA, Council of Economic Advisors, from 1989 to 1993. That was under President Bush the uh, first. Uh, and uh, the um, Independent Council for Excellence in Government rated uh, Michael C.A. Uh, uh, chairmanship as one of the, uh, well, his Council of Economic Advisors is one of the five most respected agencies out of 100 in the federal government. He chaired an extremely influential Blue Ribbon Commission on the Consumer Price Index, uh, and that's led to, uh, to very important uh, implications for how we measure inflation and uh, how the government accounts for GDP and growth in GDP and productivity, labor productivity. So he's had a huge impact just there, that by itself. But um, but also when he was at the council, he was heavily involved, uh, as I rec if I recall this correctly, with uh, instituting NAPFA, um, the um, nor the North American uh, tr Trade Agreement, the um, uh, he's been involved in uh, things like the Brady uh, debt negotiations with uh, Argentina and other uh, countries during that period. But over the years, since he's been out of government, I know that he's been interacting with uh, members of Congress on a routine basis and members of the different administrations, both Republican and Democrats, uh, he serves on lots of corporate boards and philanthropic boards. He's a public speaker. He speaks a, a lot uh, to uh, national and international groups about domestic and, and international policy. Uh, he received, Michael received his uh, BA with highest honors and the Chancellor's Award as Outstanding Undergraduate in 1967 from the University of, Chicago, of California, Berkeley. Now, Michael, that's quite something. The Chancellor's Award is Outstanding Undergraduate at Berkeley. That's uh, not a, a minor um, affirmation of your uh, capacities as a, as a student and 
Potential Scholar. Then you received an MA in 1968 and a PhD in 1971, both, both from Berkeley. And he's taught at Harvard and at Yale in addition to Stanford. He's the author of more than 100 books and articles. He's internationally recognized for his research on global economic growth, tax and budget theory and policy, social security, U.S. saving and consumption patterns, the implications of changing technology and demography on capital, labor, and product markets. He's received all manner of awards from different, uh, you know, distinguished, but one of the, I think, important awards is a distinguished teaching award from Stanford because he's such a fantastic teacher, as we're going to hear in a moment. So I'll just stop there, but people can certainly go and wiki uh, uh, Michael Boskin. And, uh, but today I want to talk with you about Michael's most recent uh, edited book uh, with uh, together with John R Radner and uh, Kiran Shrid Shridhar. Uh, it's called Defense Budgeting for a Safer World. This is it. It's thick, right? It has 37 contributors. Uh, the contributors are a who's who of national defense. Uh, we've got uh, people like General Matt and we have, um, uh, we have uh, well, Michael himself, but we have um, Condoleezza Rice. We have uh, uh, Leon Panetta, former head of the budget, but also former head of the CIA. We have um, uh, just uh, uh, Jim Mattis, uh, General Mattis, H.R. McMaster. These are names that are pretty, pretty familiar to a lot of people. Uh, but then there's a whole list of people here that are true experts, but are not publicly all that well known, but they're writing these really striking uh, pieces in this book that just kind of knock your socks off because I've been looking at a few of them. We've got uh, endorsements here from Robert Gates, former Secretary of Defense and Director of the CIA, Henry Kissinger just passed. General Petraeus, David Petraeus, former director of the CIA and U.S. Army, former commander, U.S. Central Command, and uh, he was also commander of NATO and U.S. forces in Afghanistan. Douglas Holtzit Eakin, who uh, Michael and I know is a terrific economist and former director of the CBO, Congressional Budget Office. General uh, Joseph uh, Dunford, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and commandant of the Marine Corps. So. If anybody was worried or concerned or interested in, in understanding our defense posture and situation and, and threats, uh, this is the book to get. Um, and we're going to talk about it, but I want, want to stop and let Mike, Michael give us a little background of how he got into economics and into the policy world. And, uh, you know, give, give us a little feeling for what you accomplished when you were at the CA. I know it's a long time ago, but I think it's interesting for people to know how policy actually operates and how important one person can, what a difference one person can make uh, if they do have a position of power down there, if they're sensible. So, Barry, take Barry, first of all, thank you for that too gracious an introduction. Um, I think you not only hit the highlights, you hit almost everything. So, <laughs> in any event, um, I had a very serendipitous path to, uh, to economics and policy and the opportunity to serve my country in the government, out of the government. Uh, I wandered into introductory economics my sophomore year. I was pre-med my freshman year. Looking back on it, I think that was primarily to make my parents happy. Um, and I just wasn't all that interested in most of the subject matter. Um, but I wandered into an introductory economics course my sophomore year. And while the lecture was very dry, I just fell in love with the material. The idea of trying to understand how the economy operates, how policy has the potential, I guess if we were quoting Keynes for good or evil, uh, to actually improve people's lives. And uh, that seemed to me to be kind of a more of a broad-based approach than if I had become a doctor and helping one person at a time if I was a clinician, for example. Uh, so it was very appealing. And then the summer between my junior and senior year of college, 
I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. So I, I was thinking of applying both to law school and graduate school. And I went around the country and talked to people in the leading economics departments and law schools. And, uh, and then I spoke to some friends, parents, uh, three in particular, who were lawyers. And by then, given I was 17 and they were, uh, you know, obviously in their mid 40s or something, uh, they had become a little disillusioned with law. They had become kind of a grind more than they had thought. Now, I don't know what type of law I'd have gone into if I'd gone to law school. Uh, and maybe it was to law's benefit that I switched to economics. But I fell in love with this. So I took graduate courses my senior year of college, and I was able to finish quite quickly my PhD program. Um, I did go to Harvard for four days um, and went back to Berkeley, where I'd been an undergraduate, uh, because I ran into a lot of graduate students at Harvard who were there for quite a long time. Now, that was, you know, during the Vietnam War, maybe that had something to do with it. But I just, you know, I came from a very, very modest means. I wanted to finish and get a job. Uh, you know, I was the first person in my family to finish college. So going to graduate school, in addition to that, was kind of, kind of postponing making a living. So uh, it all worked out great. And the kinds of economics that, the aspects of economics that interest me, um, were the, those that were relevant to policy. That doesn't mean it was just the policy itself. But it was the, you know, the theory and the econometrics that were useful in analyzing problems that fit into policy. And I was very lucky to have some, uh, some great teachers uh, and uh, a couple of whom won, won Nobel Prizes subsequently. And uh, so I decided to become a professional economist and I uh, decided to come to Stanford, which was a great place to be a young scholar at the time. Uh, and I think still is. And so I've had most of my career here but I first got interested in policy um, and most directly involved testifying to Congress on Social Security in the 1970s, when it became pretty clear that Social Security was going to have some financing problems before too long. So a very nice man, uh, Senator Ed Muskie from Maine, was chairman of the Budget Committee, and he asked me very politely to come uh, testify. And I did, and I was on a panel with three people in wheelchairs and myself. And they were all complaining about disability wasn't working for them, et cetera. And whatever the fact of the matter was, a very odd juxtaposition for me to be saying that it's got long run financial problems and we need to do something about it. So it, it got me, it was my introduction to you can get set up if you're not too careful in a congressional testimony. <laughs> um, so, uh, but in any event, I learned from that experience and I started thinking a lot more. And my, my, interests were really quite broad in economics. I actually took classes in six or seven fields as a graduate student and tried to remain at least knowledgeable in, in, a, in a subset, but they're mostly around fiscal issues, taxes, spending, deficits, debt, uh, evaluation of spending programs, the big programs, uh, tax reform, things of that sort. Uh, but also I became very interested in how things are measured in economics. Something I know that you've played an important role in, uh, in your career, Larry, uh, especially on the fiscal side. And uh, it became clear to me that uh, people were using um, very slippery, uh, uh, inaccurate measures of various things, which maybe quarter to quarter wasn't a big deal. But when you looked at longer terms over a, a decade or two or over a lifetime, it could add up to a very, very big change. So that became kind of my focus of my work. And I published and you became you know, one becomes noticed in the profession and in the policy circles. And so eventually I got asked to uh, help President, like then candidate Reagan and his campaign. I become pretty close to Howard Baker, who became Senate Majority Leader and I think became famous for his role in, uh, as the Republican lead on the Watergate uh, Committee and asking what did the president know and when did he know it, uh, which is a refrain that's repeated over and over again over the years. Um, and in any event, uh, so I, you know, my politics seem to be more, uh, more attuned, my political economy, my economics views, which were very much shaped by what I viewed as the tremendous distortion and destruction of high inflation, which is really defining, uh, uh, along with the oil shocks and a uh, deep recession, uh, followed uh, a few years later by another deep recession, were really the kind of defining characteristics of, this, uh, of my early career. Uh, so I became very interested in the harmful effect of high tax rates, in the uh, problems caused by inflation. Uh, you know, I, I, I consider myself 
a hobbyist in intellectual history of economics, but I do remember that Lenin said something that I'm paraphrasing now, inflation is how it will destroy the bourgeoisie. And Keynes said, uh, inflation is how the government steals from the middle class. So, um, so these were pretty defining things. And then there became something called supply side economics. Now, of course, we've known supply and demand matter in economics, both micro and macro for a long time. But uh, because there was what has come to be called old Keynesianism, Keynesianism, very simple. Uh, most people are consuming out of their current cash flow. They don't worry about the future. We don't take much account of their future expectations. Incentive, they don't have much about incentives. Uh, and time horizons were relatively short. Um, that seemed to be causing problems. And the uh, explanation for how we had stagflation high inflation and a recession simultaneously in 1980 um, seemed to be pretty much off the mark. Uh, and so while some people have exaggerated supply side economics to oversimplify that any reduction in a tax rate pays for itself, of course, it will affect the tax base, but it has to have a sizable effect to actually affect revenue. Some things do, some don't. When tax rates get really high, obviously, they have a much better chance of doing that. But anyway, that's, I think, kind of became a big issue, and it became a bipartisan issue briefly. Uh, in, a, in 1978, Senator Benson uh, chaired the Finance Committee, who I uh, was friendly with, and uh, he had a, a great report talking about the supply side problems in the economy, which was used as a big change in thinking. Uh, and then that morphed into a bipartisan call for lower tax rates. People remember Kemp Roth and the Reagan tax cuts. They don't much remember that uh, Bill Bradley and Dick Gephardt, uh, two Democrats, one in the Senate, one in the House, had a more or less analogous tax reform. It wasn't quite as large, et cetera, but it really aimed to flatten rates and broaden the base uh, and the like. Um, so that was kind of a heyday for that kind of thinking. But then from then on, the intellectual history of economics, I think, has seen more and more people pay a lot more attention to incentives, expectations, and time horizons, and of course, your work uh, and your work with Larry, uh, Larry, your work with Alan Auerbach and Bill Gale is a very uh, important aspect of that. It maybe, in a sense, has taken that to uh, an important further development and the next generation, you might say. So, so tell us a little bit about the time at the CA. Uh, you know, uh, how did you get appointed? When did the call come? How does that? You know, and what? You know. How often were you meeting with the president? What's it like, you know, kind of physically uh, being in the old executive office building over at the White House? Uh, you know, what, what's life like being a CA chairman? And then what did you get involved in uh, where you think you made a difference? Well, let me start with uh, advising candidate Reagan. So uh, our dear friend, late Secretary of State George Schultz, who recently passed out to Henry Kissinger at 100, um, uh, had a dinner for then candidate Reagan, and he had several economists, myself, Milton Friedman, a couple of others. And Milton was ordered to push Reagan hard on supporting disinflation from the 13%. And I was asked to kick the tires on supply side economics. And despite the kind of media caricature of President Reagan, he had a much more sophisticated view of supply side economics. He thought that when tax rates got really high, that you could lower taxes and raise revenue, or when they were on something which was uh, the tax base was very mobile, would be how we would say it. He didn't say it in quite those words. He had a pretty sophisticated answer. Um, and he had been head of a union, he had been in Hollywood, and he had seen what high tax rates did to movies being made elsewhere and so on. So I think that um, I would say probably the, uh, the main contribution I made on this tax advisory task force uh, was on indexing tax brackets uh, we accelerated depreciation to try to move closer to consume, a cash flow or consumed income tax. But importantly, I was instrumental, I think, uh, trying to be not immodest or a variety of us, but we were kind of pushing for what became IRAs and, and the uh, expansion and allowance of 401ks. So I think that was uh, a pretty big deal and something I'm very proud of. Now, was it perfect? No. You know, it's a sausage making as it gets through Congress. Uh, but it was quite interesting to see what happened because uh, the Democrats had a majority in the, in the House. 
Um, and the Republicans had taken the Senate in 1980, along with Reagan's very large victory. Uh, but he was able to command a uh, sizable following among what were called blue dog Democrats, moderate to conservative Southern Democrats, fiscally conservative Southern Democrats, and was able to get all that passed. And they had to adjust it a few times. It probably got overdone originally, and we wound up subsidizing investment rather than moving to neutrality and so on. Uh, but in any event, so I then um, wrote, a, uh, wrote a book called Reagan and the Economy, Successes, Failures, Unfinished Agenda, which apparently his vice president, George H.W. Bush, found quite intriguing. So he asked me when I was in Washington to come visit, visit him every time I was in Washington, whether it's for the National Science Foundation panel or the CBO, or whatever I was doing um, at the time. And so I did, and we would have breakfast at the Naval Observatory or we'd meet at his uh, White House office. And then he asked me to help him in his campaign, which turned out to be a lot of fun. It was demanding and tense at times. Um, uh, but, and it was where you really learned how second, third, and fourth best welfare economics, as economists call it, gets done in the real world. You know, like, um, uh, Ray, uh, Bush, like Reagan, was a free trader intellectually, but he had to win Pennsylvania. And uh, my dear friend, the late Jack Heinz, a senator from Pennsylvania, said he wouldn't endorse him in Pennsylvania and support him and campaign with him unless he continued the steel quotas that had been put in during the Reagan administration. Um, so this is kind of unlovely, but we managed to figure out a way to deal with that, which is basically we maintain them and phase them down and out in four years. So you, you have to make compromises like that in the real world. And that was eye opening. And then um, when President Bush got elected, he asked me to be CEA chair. Uh, I had met uh, my wife, Chris, Larry, who you know well, and uh, feels very close to you. Um, she, uh, she was all in, even though it was going to disrupt her career. She had a, a career in magazine publishing. And so she was able to more or less transplant that with a different job in New York and work there during the week while I was working my tail off in the White House. Um, but the CEA is an interesting institution. It was set up by the Employment Act of 1946 uh, or 48, uh, and its role was to get good economic advice to the president. Um, contrary to popular opinion, um, it is not the assigned um, representative of the American Economic Association. It's giving good advice to the president. Um, now, often that will involve doing something that most economists think, think is correct. But sometimes you get into a situation where the economic modeling or the essays, et cetera, that have been written that you've come to think of as good guidelines, leave out something really important and you have to adapt on the fly. I'll give you an example of that. Um, during the first Gulf War, uh, people might remember uh, that Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait and Bush said this will not stand and uh, organized a coalition, um, got Congress to approve it. We actually in the end got at the allies to pay the entire cost. Um, but Bush wanted me to decide when to release the strategic petroleum reserve, which legally is vested in the Secretary of Energy. Um, so I had a bit role along the side sidelines. And all the studies that you, when to release the strategic petroleum reserve were that you release it immediately as you have the first, as soon as prices go up. So that's the most powerful. But they had, they were not models with excess capacity. And the Saudis and the Emiratis had large excess capacity. If we, re, we released our petroleum reserve, they weren't going to pump more. So we waited, got them to pump more, and they released it the night that Desert Storm actually started. But I had an opportunity to work closely with the president. And I think because I had helped him some in his campaign, um, and because we got along well, um, I got an opportunity along with my colleagues, John Taylor and Dick Schmollenzi, two terrific economists, who are my colleagues on the council, to get involved in a really wide range of activities, um, uh, including um, uh, have, how we were, we were going to deal with cleaning up the savings and loans and third world debt of the money center banks that were the financial crisis of the era in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, we were involved in how we were going to deal with liberalizing trade. Um, President Bush thought it was very important that we uh, improve our relations with Mexico and we help the reformers in Mexico. 
Um, so that's how that came about, um, actually out of a breakfast that Secretary of State Jim, Jim Baker and I had. And we thought liberalizing trade would be a good idea. Baker had been instrumental in the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement. And that laid the seeds. And then um, a year or so later, uh, Carla Hills was approached by Jaime Sarapouche at uh, at Davos and saying that uh, Mexico's president wanted to explore the idea of what actually wound up becoming NAFTA, which I think while it's gotten um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of venom um, and, and did need to be updated, let me admit, it was you know, 30 years later, um, it actually, I think, on balance, the studies would show benefited the U.S. And obviously, it was a big benefit to Mexico. Um, obviously, there are people who were hurt by this and uh, one thing economists have to remember is the real world implications of what they do. And when we, when we have a, an analysis that says, um, well, you could in theory compensate the losers, therefore it's a good idea. Well, if the losers are very broad based and it's not really a huge hit to them and it's not four or five or six different things that hit the same people all at once, that's one thing. But we, we didn't do a good enough job in and we don't today in, in giving people better options to uh, improve their lives if they're dislocated by a trade shock or an energy shock or something like that. So um, uh, that left a very deep impression on me. And I always, I always thought that, but actually being there and rather than advising on policy, being in, in the Oval Office while we're arguing options, um, that left a very big impression on me. So I, I was very pleased with that. I would say it is, the, what you can do as CA chair depends a lot on the political situation. Uh, at first, it depends on your relationship with the president and him vesting some authority in you and everybody else thinking that, therefore, they should listen when you say something. Um, if that's not the case, very much analogous to Secretary of State going around the world if they don't think the president, uh, that the Secretary of State speaking for the president doesn't do much good. So, um, but in any event, uh, we were able to get I think a lot done. When I think of um, the situation we're in, however, I think we had 42 or three Republican senators and 190 House Senate, uh, House Republicans. So Democrats had large, overwhelming majorities in both. So it's not going to be easy for Bush to push what he wanted to do. So we tried. We made some. We had to make some compromises, which got him, I think, in a vice between the further right part of the Republican Party and the left, uh, and the Democratic Party, who wanted to get rid of them, you know, and get a Democrat back in. But it kind of got uh, kind of got him into uh, a, a very difficult political situation. And he had uh, he had Buchanan and then Perot and uh, wasn't able to get reelected. But I think on balance, uh, we did a lot of good. I would add one other thing, one other perspective, which I think all of my predecessors and successors that I've spoken to about this share, that a big part of being a good economist of adding a lot of social value in government is preventing bad ideas from happening or get, coming to fruition or nipping them or channeling them into something much less damaging. Um, you mentioned uh, Ken Arrow at the start, our uh, late Ken Arrow, my, my Stanford colleague, and along with Milton Friedman and Paul Samuelson, probably the three greatest economist in the middle of the last century. Um, he always said his greatest social value added was killing the idea of the U.S. spending a fortune building a supersonic transport. So he didn't think that penciled out a cost-benefit analysis even closely. And of course, the British and the French did, and then they wound up having to dump it after a while. So um, there's a lot to be said for good economics. Uh, but it's also important to remember economics isn't the only input to policy, including economic policy. Uh, and it's important to keep your backbone. It's important to, it's important also to try to find viable solutions to problems which the president, the executive branch, or the nation, by the Congress and the executive branch, uh, is trying to accomplish. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, so it's easy to be a purist if you want, uh, and you don't want to. Uh, compromise beyond what makes good sense in principle, but you sometimes have to swallow hard and settle for two thirds of a loaf rather than a whole. So, so let's segue, uh, this seems like, a you know, the, uh, the issue of, um, uh, you know, good policy and, um, 
compromise and getting getting us ready, making sure that uh, uh, you stop bad things from happening. Uh, all that is a little bit involved with this in this book, comes up in this book. Uh, you know, it's called Defense Budgeting for a Safer World. I'll just show everybody the book again. You can now buy it on Amazon or any your, your, probably your local bookstores, better thing to do, keep those bookstores going, uh, or Barnes and Nobles, wherever, indie books. Uh, but uh, this is an extraordinary book and it's really, it is about budgeting, but it's also about our national security uh, situation. And so some people here are talking about, in the book about uh, dramatically increasing our defense budget uh, by a factor of three from about two and a half percent of GDP to maybe over six, uh, seven percent of GDP, uh, which is still a whole lot lower than it was during World War II, for example, but they're so concerned about uh, China and Russia and uh, uh, other threats that we're facing, but particularly China. And then we have um, some people saying that the uh, if, under my quick skimming of the book, because I haven't had time to read every page, that uh, we just read, need to reorganize what we're doing much more effectively. Some other people are saying it, it appears that we need to uh, figure out what our best strategy is in terms of how we spend our dollars. Uh, it's not so much the absolute number of dollars, but how we're allocating them, because I think in absolute terms, we're spending more than uh, China by some factor, but I'm not sure that that's actually for sure the case. Um, and then we've got some other people, um, you know, we're talking, the very first chapter here is about, uh, written by someone who's not all that well known. Um, her name is, uh, just get the, uh, hang on a second. Um, this is about China, and uh, I just, when I started reading this chapter, I was like, kind of floored. Um, this is Oriana Schuyler Mastro, and Oriana Schuyler Mastro is um, just, uh, she's a center fellow at the Freeman uh, Spogli Institute for International studies and courtesy assistant professor of political science at Stanford, where her research focuses on Chinese military and security policy, Asia Pacific security issues, war termination, and coercive diplomacy. She was previously an assistant professor of security studies at Georgetown University. She's also a non-resident senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and continues to serve in the US Air Force Reserve for which she works as a strategic planner at US Indio, India, Indo Pacific Command. So here's just one of the many people, the 37 authors of this book, but you, she's really the, the first chapter in the book and it's called The Military Challenge of the People's Republic of China. And if you read this, uh, there's like one shocker after the next, uh, uh, China is gonna have a Navy, it seems like within, 15 years, it's uh, twice the size of ours. You have the, her listing off all of the different, uh, you know, uh, weapons that they have, uh, missiles, just an array of different missile systems um, uh, that are land-based, air-based, sea-based. Uh, you have, this is, you know, she's considering China's ability to basically invade Taiwan and whether we could repel that in invasion. President Biden has said that we are going to defend Taiwan. It's not cl exactly clear what that means, but this author is saying that um, we don't really have the ability to do it. Uh, and, you know, I think it's a great leading chapter because it tells us that if we want to respond, uh, if we want to be in a position to uh, stand up to China, uh, we have to uh, kind of put up or shut up, uh, you know, go big or go, go, go small or go home is one of the names of one of the chat, one of the titles, of one of the chapters later on in the book uh, saying, 
kind of complementing this chapter that says, look, uh, we have a long way to go to really be able to to um, pr protect Taiwan, uh, really def def uh, really confront China from taking over the South China Sea and and good part of that part of you know Asia, Japan, South Korea, Philippines. Uh, it looks very ominous, and uh, and then there's another thing that's being raised here, which is whether we're just sitting ducks, whether we have military uh, capacity or, or Navy has aircraft carriers that could be taken out like in an afternoon, so that the and that we have air bases in Japan and some other places near China that could be destroyed within minutes. Um, so, Michael, let, let's. Um, you know, give us your overview of the book, but also uh, let's talk a little bit about this particular chapter, since we can't handle the entire book, cover it. Uh, let's talk about this issue, which I think is the biggest issue f for defense and, and strategy and procurement and, uh, you know, policy about Pentagon spending, you know. And, you know, if you, if you, so one one question I have is, you know, if you're, if you're in charge of spending the defense budget, how many more aircraft carriers would you build? Uh, if they have a hypersonic missile in China that can get to our aircraft carriers in a minute, matter of minutes with our, without our being able to uh, defend against them. Well, let me, let me start by giving an overview and then come back to the specific question. Of course, we all hope that uh, anything resembling a serious confrontation with China can be avoided. But um, right. I think the place to start is this is not just green eye shade stuff. You know, budgets can be very boring. Probably some of your listeners feel that way about their own personal budget. But in any event, um, I think the best way to sum it up is what former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and Secretary of State, Colin Powell, said, show me the budget and I'll show you my strategy. Um, the ability to deter aggression rests on the capability of our military and of course, our alliances and diplomacy and intelligence as well. Um, the, the strength of the military rests squarely on the budget, which provides not just the resources, but the authorities, the legal uh, ability to, to do different things. Uh, that's embedded in something called the National Defense Authorization Act, which just passed the Senate uh, yesterday, number one, and then the appropriations that are laid out in the defense budget. Now, everybody's aware that the Pentagon is large, it's bureaucratic, it spends a lot of money. We have an all volunteer force. Um, they are still the strongest, most capable in the world, but, um, and without getting into the pros and cons, ex ante or ex post of any deployments the military has had, by our political leaders, uh, that's the good news. Um, the bad news is of the $886 billion, that's the number that's being discussed now, they have it in the debate about uh, defense appropriations as part of the uh, negotiations going on between the House and the Senate. Uh, it was 858 or something like that last year. That's a lot of money. Uh, stuffed into that, are a lot of things that have almost nothing to do with national security that belong in other agencies. Why? Because you have to pass the National Defense Authorization Act to authorize the military to go ahead. Even if you just have continuing resolutions, you have to let the military spend or they can't pay soldiers, et cetera, sailors and Marines. Um, they can't pay contractors when they deliver stuff. So that being said, um, we have an opportunity to realign, refocus, and get a bigger bang from the buck. My own view after studying this carefully, and it's, it's influenced by all the people in here who have different points of view. These are leaders that uh, have served in administrations of both parties, some, some both parties, some one or the other, uh, and they've head of cyber command, undersecretary for policy, procurement, personnel, et cetera, head of the defense innovation unit. Um, former chair of the joint of the uh, joint chief, former uh, head of the uh, former chair of the House uh, Armed Services Committee. 
So with all that expertise, I've come to a conclusion that we need to do both and we need to do both with more of a sense of urgency. Uh, I don't think at the moment we need to have the gigantic increases people are talking about to 6% of GDP, but I think that we're going to need to spend more. Uh, President Biden every year proposes a 10-year real decline in defense spending, which will be quite harmful. Um, if we went back to a year when the defense budget was deemed reasonable or too tight, 2010, which was the year before what economists and budgeteers remember as a sequester, something that wasn't supposed to happen, but the agreement that there would be large cuts in defense and non-defense discretionary spending, that modest part of the budget that isn't that is annually appropriated, not entitlements like Social Security and Medicare. Um, but that part of the budget, the thought was Republicans wouldn't stand for defense cuts and Democrats wouldn't stand for uh, non-defense discretionary cuts for programs that they and their constituents like. So they come to an agreement. Well, they didn't. It was a very large cut. Um, I don't think anybody would argue the challenges we face. I'm going to use the word challenges because threats is one way to describe it. And, but hopefully most of those will, uh, will abate. But the challenges we face are certainly as dangerous and complex. Many of the people here and others have said this is the most complex geopolitical situation now we have with the rise of China and its assertiveness in Asia, uh, Putin and Ukraine and perhaps other uh, intentions, Iran in the Middle East and its proxies of terrorism. Uh, so this is the most dangerous we face since the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, in any event, um, whether you believe that to be true or not, I think it's at least as dangerous back then. And if we just adjusted the defense budget for inflation since then, uh, this 886 we're talking about is probably a hundred billion light on that score. That just gives you a, a way to think about it. Now, do that whole hundred billion dollars have to come from appropriations in a tight fiscal situation where you have a, too large a national debt and we have impending cash shortfalls in Social Security and Medicare in the coming decade, which are going to be their own challenges? Um, some of it can come from other sources. We can get a bigger bang for the buck. We can get better efficiencies. The Pentagon put in a program, Secretary McNamara in the 1960s, called the program, uh, Planning Program uh, uh, and Execution System, PPBE, Planning, Programming, Budget Execution. And it was geared toward long-term, exquisite, gigantic procurement of super new fighters, bombers, ships, et cetera. Um, that's still the system used today. It's, uh, it, it, there's some workarounds, but it's very cumbersome. Back then, almost all the technology the military used was either done, uh, produced or financed by the military. Now, most advanced technology is done commercially, and there's a lot of stuff you can buy off the shelf that is cheaper, more advanced than some of the stuff being built into some of our weaponry. So we're gonna to have to become more agile. We're going to, there's plenty of room for efficiencies. So other kind of silly stuff. Um, for example, when in 1970, the National Defense Authorization Act was 10 pages long and passed on a voice vote in one day. This year it's thousands of pages long, stuffed with line items. Now there are reasons for those line items, some of them political, some of them not reasonable. And in the, in the post-Vietnam War era, there was a sense that the military was left and the, and the CIA was left unchecked and there were a bunch of reforms put in, probably overdid it, uh, but there was a natural reaction to some of what were considered some abuses back then. And so we were left with this system, so we're going to have to become more nimble. Um, and it's going to be tricky because we're going to have to do this in, in a, a decade where we're going to have to do some fiscal tightening. Uh, and uh, that's going to be awkward messaging and it's going to have to be done with some education on the part of the president and the congress explaining why we need to do this for our security and our ally security and our freedoms and our prosperity you know the, the navy keeps sea lanes open for example um we'd be in very tough shape if we didn't have a navy capable of doing that but the navy's been shrinking unfortunately we have to be alert to risks in several different theaters in the Middle East, as we've seen, 
in Eastern Europe, in, in Asia, in the South China Sea and Indo-Pacific. We have allies in those areas that can help. They need to do more. We need to, they're starting to work more cooperatively. And we're starting to do some better integration of our intelligence and our, our militaries. Um, but there, there are opportunities to do a lot more. We can get rid of the wasteful end of year, use it or lose it spending. We could have, we could at least index for inflation, the carryover authority you have if you go over your budget a little bit. But we, we, we waste a lot of resources because of silly restrictions put in. Um, and we could relax, I don't know, pick a number, a dozen, a half dozen of those a year for a few years, and we'd get some sizable efficiencies. Will that be enough by itself? No. We're going to have to drive a lot of change in the military and in Congress. Uh, but that will have to be something that is not just um, done in the budget, but also in the culture uh, of the Pentagon, where they're used to having very, very long time horizons. And that just doesn't work in a world where commercial product cycles are months or a year at most. So, 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 so let me... Let me raise this question with you. So, so we have this kind of um, threat challenge with China. Uh, uh, you know, they feel uh, Taiwan's part of their country, and uh, uh, we're a long way away from Taiwan. If we uh, decided that Cuba was a part of our country, uh, they would have a hard time. And they were allied, and Cuba was allied with China at some level. Uh, China would have a hard time defending Cuba from where it's located. Uh, but, you know, the, so there's that. But then the other issue is that China has become as large an economy as we are. Uh, the European Union is slightly bigger than both of us, but uh, a paper I just wrote with some co-authors called The Future of Economic Power. It's at my website, kotlikoff.net, suggests that by the end of the century, even if you assume that labor productivity in China uh, is basically slower than it has been in the last 20 years by a margin. You still have China, even with the demographics going against it, with uh, China losing 400 million people, the bigger than our current population in terms of their total population by the end of the century, you still end up with China uh, having roughly 35% of world GDP. We're down to about 11%. Uh, is around 11 or so, 12%. So India and China together are basically half the world's GDP. So the question then is, uh, are we trying to, you know, are we um, uh, engaged in something that's really hopeless, that we can't really um, uh, hope to be the hegemon of the world, uh, you know, <laughs> of, of Asia, uh, let alone the rest of the world through time that we need to be focused more on diplomacy and uh, pushing the Taiwanese to come up with some kind of a time frame under which they will uh, join with China under certain conditions that both sides can agree to. Uh, and then if those conditions are met, then that it's, it's just an open ended until they are met when as soon as they are met, this happens. But you know, if we can lower the spending by both sides, that's another way forward. And I'm just worried that we're, you know, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, whatever, what's the expression, something about uh, fighting a windmill or something. Uh, jousting with windmills. Jousting with a windmill um, in this in this framework. You know, after I read this, this article about China by this person who knows about all the military systems they have in ours, it's not even clear that if we had three times the defense spending, uh, three times the equipment that we would actually be able to defend Taiwan. But is that really the way we would, is defending Taiwan really defending it militarily? Or is it saying we're going to give Taiwan in the event of an invasion, whatever assistance we can militarily in terms of sending over ammunition, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I don't think the president has committed our, you know, President Biden to actually uh, having a, a shooting war with China in the event that they were to invade. 
So do you see, you know, you've had a lot of interaction with the Chinese over the years at the very highest level. Do you, do you see uh, that things have gotten too hot uh, and that we can bring down the temperature and get both sides to reduce their spending uh, and stop this arms race that, that we seem to, we're seeing here? Well, I think that's not entirely up to us. We don't get to choose. We can help frame that. Uh, I think it's a very good thing that we're, we've reestablished after the APEC summit, um, military to military communication. I think that's always dangerous to have that cut off. I think it's always a good idea to speak and speak frankly and honestly and uh, about your interests with, uh, uh, with others, including people who are uh, competitors and potential adversaries. Um, I don't see war with China as in any way inevitable. I think it would be horrible for the world and horrible for each side if it happened. But I think you cannot have the United States be in a position of weakness because that puts a horrible uh, dilemma before our policymakers. Imagine right now, given how long it would take our Navy to get to Taiwan from San Diego or, or from Honolulu, um, take a look at a map of the Pacific and you realize it takes a long time. Uh, you don't want his only option to be taking out some Chinese ships with long range precision missiles and, and risking something much worse you know, when they respond. On the other hand, um, so I think the answer is to have capability more forward based, which that served us well in uh, if in NATO's case, for example, uh, throughout the post -Cold, the post World War II period, um, and I think that we have to work more closely with our allies, as we're doing in various ways. For in, uh, some with AUKUS, some with uh, uh, with Five Eyes intelligence sharing, some with uh, the Philippines, some with uh, with Japan, uh, with Korea. So I think all those are things we can do while telling the Chinese that we, we're not trying to encircle you in any way. We're not trying to say you don't have uh, the right to express your uh, strong interest. Um, and then I think the hope is that the strategic ambiguity that has that served well for a while will continue. Now, Taiwan has elections in January. We'll see what happens in those elections, whether the person will be uh, more independence minded or less. But there are many other um, risks that we face uh, beyond outright military confrontation. And by the way, the military people tell me that the west coast of Taiwan is not a very particularly hospital place for seaborne invasion. Um, I think people are concerned more with what would happen if there was a blockade of China. And I'm concerned about what would happen if they of were Taiwan. Sorry, I mean, of China. China, yeah, pardon me. China blockading Taiwan. And I'm also concerned about uh, cyber activity shutting down um, uh, Ty much of Taiwan's economy. Uh, uh, Chinchu Industrial Park, where Taiwan Semiconductor is uh, primarily located, uh, that they produce, although a fair amount in China. Uh, a lot of the world's advanced chips. Yes, we're reshoring some of that. We can argue whether that's a good diversification strategy and how, how well we're, we're doing it. But the fact of the matter is there are a lot of other things that could happen. And I, I think it's important that the United States be um, able to respond and give options to our political leaders, the president, future presidents, uh, on how to respond if something like that happens. Um, I, I believe the very least we need to do is very much speed up. Taiwan has been waiting years for weaponry it's paid for already. So our defense industrial base, which has declined considerably, and it's one reason we've had uh, trouble explaining to the public that a lot of the money being requested right now for assistance to Ukraine will be spent here on re restocking our supplies that we've sent to them already. Um, so a lot of that is just going to domestic manufacturing. Uh, we need to be in a situation where where we can be nimble. I mean, the world's dangerous. We wish it wasn't so. Uh, I think if the U.S. retreated into a shell, became more isolationist, 
I think that would be extremely dangerous, not just for us, but for the world. Is there some some major, you know, uh, let's say um, some way to leverage um, our giving Taiwan, let's say, massive military uh, missile capacity so that they could basically take out Shanghai and, and Beijing in the event of an invasion uh, and use that that potential aid as a, as a way to get the Chinese to lower the temperature and reduce their spending and their threats. Is there, I mean, that's what I'm trying to think about, some alternative way. And then I want to also to get you to address, since we don't have too much time left, Ukraine and, and how you see things playing out there and, and how you view, you know, where the Republicans are, whether we're gonna actually get uh, additional aid to Ukraine coming out of this Congress. Uh, given the position of some of the Republicans in the House? I think we have to be very careful about um, giving and blessing offens offensive weaponry in Taiwan. I think we need to make sure they have tremendous capability to defend themselves in various ways. And that obviously would involve some damage to China's military if something came out. But uh, I, would, I would be very reluctant to uh, put put China in a situation where it felt militarily threatened by Taiwan. I think that is really, I think the game theory of that is probably not going to end well for Taiwan or the United States. Um, on Ukraine, I think something will pass. I think we do have a, a, a charitably described as a uh, as a disaster at our southern border. Uh, there are many dimensions of that disaster, from humanitarian to security to the rule of law and so on. But um, uh, so I think the Republicans are holding firm on wanting some change in policy and not having this uh, extremely stretched definition of a legitimacy of asylum and, uh, and parole and so on. Uh, so we'll see what winds up happening there. Uh, but I think there's strong bipartisan support for continuing to support Ukraine. Now, I think there are calls, not without reason, um, about where does all this go and where does this end? Is this just an open-ended commitment forever for a brutal slugfest, uh, slugfest in eastern Ukraine? Um, and, you know, where does that leave us? So I think you're going to see some uh, compromise eventually reached. I think it will probably uh, more involve things like greater accountability for how the money is actually being spent when it is in Ukraine. Um, so I, I think that's probably the place where they'll be able to come to some compromise. But, you know, the Americans have, uh, and not just Americans, people in general have had a, uh, a, an understandable reluctance to, to stay involved forever for something where they don't see a, uh, an end. So I think that that is, that is a big problem. And I think that uh, Putin, it's unclear uh, from the Russia specialists that I speak to, you know, who would be next after Putin, but the general impression is it's unlikely to be any better. So uh, Russia has this interest and it's unclear that um, whatever happens in Ukraine, they wouldn't at some subsequent date decide they'd like to move into one of the Baltic states, for example, which would trigger our Article, Article 5 commitments under NATO. So we're going to have to upgrade our military. We're going to need a slightly larger military. We're going to have to be better focused. We're going to have to spend our money more wisely. We're going to need at least a little more money. Um, and I think with that in mind, we increase the odds that we're able to uh, defuse tensions in a variety of places and, more importantly, deter them from building up too much where uh, they wind up uh, unfortunately exploding. Well, I think that's a great way to uh, end this terrific podcast, Michael. I want to really thank you uh, a bunch and uh, everybody get this book. To, it's, you know, it's got a um, slightly off-putting title, Defense Budgeting for a Safer World. But, you know, I would say read it. You're going to not be able to stop reading it because it's, uh, a bit, it's a page turner because you really, you know, every page has got, every sentence has got something you didn't know before. 
that is going to just change your perspective uh, about where we are and where we're going. That's what we're trying to do, Larry. We're trying to get it all in one place. We could talk about strategy, threats, personnel, procurement, reform, right. previous attempts at reforms, what reforms can accomplish, the yeah. politics, et cetera. So hopefully people will find it a useful resource. Yeah. So this is just uh, yet another, you know, of uh, a series of uh, major Michael Boskin contributions to the world of economics and to our country. And uh, I want to say thank you for your service to the profession, but also to the country. So uh, all the best to you and Chris for the holidays, Michael. Thanks, Larry. And thanks for, uh, for having me on your podcast.